Grace Baptist Church. You find a hymn book. We'll get started this evening with page 348. Where could I go? 348. open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together. We pray that you to speak to each and every life that's representative here tonight. Father, that we might uh, be encouraged and challenged to do more than we've done before. Father, just help us as we study your word tonight. Help us in the music and the worship that we have for you. Father, we're so thankful for the great opportunity we have to serve this great salvation that we can enjoy. Just guide and direct us now in all that we do, that Father, you get the glory and the honor. In Christ's name. Amen. All right, right over page 250 for our next hymn. 250. <clears throat> he keeps me singing. Oh uh -huh. 
out this evening let's do pray for those that are not with us some that are not feeling well others that perhaps may be traveling and that God will just be with them and they may be back with us soon our verse for this week is found in 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30 if I must needs glory I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities and this morning we looked at Paul's testimony and what a testimony that was here's a man that uh, um, was the one single uh, individual that God used in a mighty way to get churches started all over Europe and uh, the Middle East and uh, did much in helping uh, the cause of Jesus Christ and he suffered much in doing so and that should give us uh, uh, a good reason to understand that you and I we may face some trials and tribulations as we serve the Lord but let's stick it out Paul never quit Shipwrecked three times. I think the first time that would have been like, eh, I don't think I want to do that again. Uh, you know, beaten a few times, left for dead after he got stoned. And then one time he had to be let down in a basket out of a, a city because they were after him. So Paul was a, a committed servant. We learned his confidence and boldness that he had in proclaiming the gospel. And nothing could stop Paul until the Lord called him home. And that was the end of his ministry. What an influence Paul's had uh, as he was dedicated and committed to the Lord, started many churches, and you and I are the beneficiaries of Paul's ministry as we read his letter and study the letters that he wrote to the different churches and understanding that that influence has made it all the way around the world at least once. Now we're going back that direction, taking the gospel back to those different regions. Tonight we're in the uh, book of Daniel chapter 3. We're looking at uh, the test of fire that uh, was confronted uh, those three Hebrew uh, men who were taken captive from Jerusalem. Uh, they uh, faced some adversity in the beginning, but they took a stand to uh, eat the vegetable soup instead of the meat of the king. Come to find out they were much more healthier than those who feasted at the king's table. And because I believe that they made a commitment to serve God and they were not going to be uh, seduced by uh, their captors in eating the things that probably were not uh, good or beneficial for them. And God honored them and they got promoted and put in high places in the government of Babylon. Then on Wednesday night we have our prayer meeting and Bible study at 6. We'd like to take prayer requests and get those put in the prayer bulletin. And so be sure and bring those, and we'll uh, take those requests. Uh, we've been looking at the book of Ephesians, seeing the different uh, parts of the weapon that Paul talks about in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and stand in the evil day. And we've looked at the helmet. Helmet, of course, uh, is our assurance of salvation as we go into battle knowing uh, our great salvation that God has wrought through Jesus Christ for us. The belt of truth, of course, that's the thing that kind of keeps it all tied together. Uh, what good would it do if we did not have the truth? And we don't just have a truth, we have the absolute truth 
from the very mouth of God. And that's a very important thing. Then, of course, the breastplate of righteousness, with his, which is the righteousness of Christ that protects the vital organs as you would put on a breastplate in battle. And, of course, uh, the righteousness of Christ is that thing that gives us the ability to continue serving him. And then we looked at the gospel shoes. Put on your gospel shoes and go and tell the world and how that, um, that uh, seemingly not as important, but shoes are important. Uh, you look at these athletes that play these different sports, and they all have their special sneakers, and, and uh, those that are playing football, they have those that have uh, good grip. Especially when it's snowing out, then you'll see they'll change their shoes uh, to make sure they have good, solid grass of the ground that they're playing on. And, uh, you know, if they do that for those uh, silly games they play, how much more should we prepare us, our shoes, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and take it to the regions around? So those are the things that we're looking at, and uh, we'll continue on in uh, Ephesians the study of the armor of God. We've had a number of birthdays in January. We'll be having our celebration February the 5th and our birthday and anniversary fellowship after the morning service. So we're looking forward to uh, feasting it together and fellowshipping. And then we'll have our sweetheart banquet coming up February the 10th at 6 p.m. And it'll be at Joshua's. And if you haven't already and want to attend, I'll sign up on the sheet back there and you have a number of things to pick for the menu and then we'll get that sent in so we can have that ready for uh, and that'll be at six o'clock um, February the 10th is a Friday and so we'll meet up there and have a little time in that back room of uh, fellowship eating and then we'll give a short devotion about how important love is not only the love of God but the love that God gives us so that we can love one another and that's very important especially in this time of uh, uh, age that we live in, a lot of uh, very unhappy and angry people. But we're not called to judge, we're called to love. And that takes a big step on our part in loving them as Christ loves them. All right, so uh, we invite you for all those services that we have coming up. All right, let's go to our next hymn, page 191, Count Your Blessings, 100. And ninety one. <clears throat> Say 
convict where they're great or small. Do not be discouraged, God is over all. your many blessings angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessing, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what For our last hymn this evening, 203, Near My God to the 203. For Daniel, if you want to pick one of those up, we're in Daniel chapter 3 this evening. A very fascinating story as we know that Daniel and his friends were carried captive from Jerusalem and Israel all the way over to Babylon. They, uh, Babylon is Iraq, and uh, a lot of interesting things are going on over there in Iraq. And uh, some of the uh, end time signs are beginning to develop and be shown as you and I live in a very troubled world. And uh, these things are not happening just by sheer uh, uh, accidents or uh, happenstance. These things are happening because God is in control. And the end times are the time to awake a people that perhaps were slumbered in their spirituality. And we titled this tonight, The Test of Fire. Now you and I as a believer, we're going to be confronted with all kinds of situations in this world. Uh, that should not be any surprise to us. God, uh, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, told us that these things 
would take place and that we would be confronted with some very troubling persecution. Just as we uh, read of Paul's testimony being shipwrecked, he didn't have to go on a mission trip. He didn't have to travel around the world, but he chose to because God impressed upon him to go and speak to those people and started many churches in the known world. And he suffered much. And you and I are going to suffer much as we uh, endeavor to serve God, uh, but that should not uh, permit us or prevent us from doing the things that God has called us to do. It takes a life that's dedicated, a life that is committed. God has saved us, and the, the price of our salvation was much. His only son was God who decided to take on human form and live among us for three, 33 and a half years, knowing that he would die on a cruel cross at the hands of the Romans. And there on that cross, his precious, innocent, perfect blood was going to be spilled. And that blood was the redemption of all mankind. Uh, and the only way that that redemption is a credit to your account is when you come to realize the state of your sinfulness before a holy God and you cry out to God to forgive you of your sin and you want that great salvation that has been wrought through Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you're ever going to have eternal life. It's not a whole lot that you need to do to get saved, but it is a whole lot that you need to do after you're saved. If you appreciate what God has done for you, if you are glad for your salvation, you need to step up to the plate and do what God has called you to do. You may, it may cost you your life. It may cost you your job. It may cost you your position in society, whatever things that you might have. But it's well worth it because I guarantee when Paul entered into heaven that glorious morning, it was said to him, thou good and faithful servant. You endured a lot for the sake of Jesus Christ, and these are your rewards for all that, your, the trouble that you went through. And I guarantee that the moment Paul entered heaven, he never had another thought of all the problems he had on earth. He only saw his blessed Savior for the second time in his life and for all of eternity. Paul will be one of those men, among others, that I hope that when we said at the Feast of the Lamb's Supper that uh, I have a chair next to the Apostle Paul. I have, a, I have a few questions I'd like to ask the Apostle Paul. I have a few questions I'd like to ask some of these other men, like Jeremiah. Jeremiah, uh, interesting book you wrote, but I don't know about some of these things that you wrote in your book. And Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I've got some questions about some of those words that you put down on those pages. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to... Uh, uh, getting to heaven, but until we get there, we need to live like the children of the King of King and Lord of Lord. That means we live a different life. We don't allow the, the world to sway us. We don't allow the world to um, and put its um, uh, philosophy and its ideas in our life, but we shed that constantly by uh, sanctifying ourselves in the very precious Word of God. And once we get cleansed by the Word of God, uh, we start anew and afresh every day in our service and allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, tonight we're going to look at this test of fire. The question that you need to ask yourself is, what would it take for me to quit on God? What would it take for me to quit on God? And here's one thing you need to understand. God has never quit on you. Now, there's times when you feel like, well, I don't know where God is. He seems to be distant. He seems to be far away. I, with absolute certainty, can tell you that God is present. Wherever you are and whatever you're involved in and whatever your challenges are, God is there with you. If you're born again by the Spirit of God, He is chosen by some overwhelming uh, reason that I can't fathom. God has chosen to dwell within you. And that there should be a cause for us to take careful steps in life. What we do, what we say, what we allow 
uh, to come into our eye gates and our ear gates and the things that we uh, meditate upon, the things that we ponder. And uh, there's one thing about the brain, it doesn't matter if you're asleep or awake, it's always working. So make sure that you have given it good material to work with. And uh, the, the, of course, the best thing is the Word of God. And so we see here these uh, Hebrew children are be, or will be confronted with a overwhelming challenge. Just kind of put yourself in their place. Here you are, a believer, a servant of God. You've been uh, taken out of your home and you've been uh, drug across the barren sand, the desert, and now you have arrived in this popular place of the world called uh, Babylon. All the false gods and all the false teaching, and all the false prophets and all the soothsayers and witchcraft and all those things are going on that you've never encountered before. And you have a decision to make. Am I going to stay true to my God or am I going to compromise so that I can make it through this? And that's many times what Satan uh, uh, confronts us with. You know, just a little compromise here and a little compromise there. It won't, nobody will ever know about it. God will. And that's the one you're going to answer to one day. And I hope it's said that uh, when we arrive in heaven uh, that we will be called good and faithful servants because we endure to the very end. And that's what is called upon us to be faithful. Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to be found faithful? Or are you going to lose those rewards and those blessings that God wanted to give you, but because you didn't follow his guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit, you've lost out on many of those things. So look with me in verses 1 through 3. The image is made and set up. An image is made and set up. Let me just... Let me just advise you that today in our world, there are many images that they are putting before you. Now, they may not be silver and gold as this uh, image is, but uh, the images of uh, false ideas, uh, half-truths, uh, these things that they bombard you with through the uh, media and the social media, you've got to be careful what you allow yourself to. Uh, to encounter because great is the deceiver and he is constantly out to deceive the believer. He doesn't care about the world. He's got them. He cares about you because you are his number one arch enemy because you have the precious blood of Jesus Christ upon your life. You're the one that can take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the regions beyond and souls can be saved and Satan doesn't want anyone to be saved. And so he can stop you. He has done his job. So what are you going to do when you're confronted with these false philosophies, these so-called science that's not science? There's nothing wrong with science as long as it holds to the data given for it. But there's a lot of science today that's just made up ideas, has no merit, has nothing that you can go to to find uh, these uh, answers uh, to life's processes. So in verse 1 through 3, we see the image is made and set up. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height were three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And when Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the prince, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providence to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then the prince and the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar king had set up. And they stood before the image, and Nebuchadnezzar, um, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So you can just envision in your mind this, this huge plain. And here's this golden idol, this golden image is standing there. And uh, everybody's come 
to dedicate this great image and of course it's none other than Nebuchadnezzar himself. He's such a powerful man. I mean he rules over all the known world and, and he has the biggest army and he has the greatest wealth that is known at that time and so he's very proud of what he's done and what he's accomplished. And so they've all come today to dedicate this remarkable image. You know, it's not too far from some of the images they're putting up in some of our town squares nowadays. You know, uh, these images of bizarre uh, things. And you say, where, where they, these ideas come? Well, it came from the very thing that happened before Noah's flood. Evil imaginations. That's where it came from. Evil imaginations. So there's the image. And here's this multitude of people. As far as the eye can see, there are people standing before this remarkable image that Nebuchadnezzar has erected. And it's made of gold. That's probably a few guys standing around thinking, well, I wonder if I can get a chip of gold off of that and uh, go out and sell it, you know. Of course, uh, gold wasn't expensive back then as it is today. I think the last I heard, it's 12000 an ounce. Uh, that makes it a very uh, valuable. You know, uh, one of those things, just on a side note, is that they always say, you know, you need to invest your money in gold so when uh, the, the uh, markets die and, uh, and the food is uh, not plenteous, uh, you'll have the wherewithal to buy because you've got this gold. <clears throat> I wonder how far you're going to get with carrying gold bar around. You know, who's going to rob you first? I don't know that that's the answer to anything. I do know who is the answer, and that's God. He'll take care of you. I, you know, the apostles and the disciples who were with Jesus, they suffered much, but they got through it. And they had the Roman Empire down on them many times. So just keep in mind, it doesn't matter uh, the source. It matters who you serve, because he will provide what you will need. That in verse 4 through 6, the commandment to worship the image. The commandment to worship the image. So here's all these people gathered. <clears throat> and then in verse 4 it says, And Herod uh, cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Notice they're all uh, nations and languages, and pearl tense. <clears throat> that at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, a uh, sackbut, a uh, psaltery, dulcimer, all kinds of music, you fall down and do what? Worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. I, I think uh, music has an ability to open your ear gates and to transmit to you things that um, maybe you're not quite getting because the music kind of covers up the words. And, and I'm very uh, keen on that in our church that we sing our songs and that we listen to the words. It's not the music that's important. It's the words. It's the message that we're getting. The world has its hymns per se. And a lot of times they're so loud with a beat, you can't hear the words. That's not by accident, folks. That's purpose. Because they want to open the ear gate and insert the words that they want you to ponder and, and think about. And you don't even know you're getting it until it's too late. And now I was back in the days of the 60s and 70s, and I, I know a lot of my friends and my, my brothers, they, uh, they like, my brother liked listening to that kind of music. I didn't really care for that kind of music. I never really got involved in it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my uh, biggest guy at the time was Glenn Campbell and Doc of the Bay, you know, something really profound there. <laughs> Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, woo -ha. Uh, uh, but they would listen to these uh, things, and, and you know, uh, it wasn't until many years ago, later that I listened to some of these songs just to, to, because I thought I knew what they said, and then I come to find out, I had no idea what they were saying. And some of these songs are just abhorrent, that they were pushing out of the airwaves. Uh, there's one that I can't still believe they play on the radio from time to time when I'm, 
I, I don't purposely do that, but sometimes, you know, it comes across. And it's like, why in the world would they allow a, such a song with a, a theme like that play on the radio? Well, I mean, I guess there's some stuff out there nowadays you can't even begin to believe what they're spewing and spouting. Um, it's abhorrent. So music has a way of just kind of, it's like a medicine. You know, it's not easy to take medicine if it tastes bad. Have you ever had bad tasting medicine? It's just hard to swallow. Uh, but I noticed that sometimes they'll take and they'll put some uh, sugary stuff to it so it's a little bit easier to swallow if you're going to take it orally. Well, you know, that's what music is. It's, uh, it's a way to get inserted into you uh, some words and some ideas and some thoughts that perhaps you wouldn't ever uh, fall into, but because of the music it kind of attracts you. It's, it, it's carnal and it's fleshly and it draws you into it. You've got to be careful. Um, <clears throat> so you have to be careful what you tune into. And the one thing that you should always tune into is God. And uh, I haven't heard it lately, but God's not speaking out of heaven directly to anyone yet. He did in times past before the word was written. But if you're going to get in tune with God, you're going to have to open this book. And I would, uh, I would advise you at least open it daily, if not a couple times a day. Because you need a spiritual bath to wash away the filth of the world, those things that have entered into your minds that God doesn't want there. And the only way you can rid yourself of the carnality and the immoral ideas the world puts on us is by the living Word of God. It does work. And so here we have this command. Fall down and worship this golden idol. What would you do? You're one of those men standing there in the plain. And here's this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he sends out a command. Uh, you've come for the dedication, and here's the dedication. You're going to worship this idol. What would you do? What would you do? Verse 7, we see the cards obey. In uh, verse 7, Therefore the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sasbuck, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all kinds of music, all kinds of music, all the people of the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. You know, this was pretty expected. Nebuchadnezzar thought, you know, I'm not going to have any problem with this. I'm going to uh, put this great, wonderful uh, image of me in gold up here on this uh, plane. And I'm going to have all these people. And they're all going to do what I say because I'm the great king of this Babylonian empire. So the musics are played. And the vast amount of people fall to the ground to worship this image. Nebuchadnezzar expected that. <laughs> but there happened to be a few men standing out there that decided, you know what? I could compromise today and no one would know it but God. And I could get away with this probably pretty easy and no one would find out about it but God. Uh, but... Uh, these men were not men of uh, easy persuasion. These men were not men that took their relationship with God casually. These were men that were committed. And you'll see how committed they were. Notice here in verses uh, 16 through 12, three Hebrew men refuse the demand. Three Hebrew men refuse the demand. Notice with me in verses uh, 8 through 12. Wherefore, at the time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And they spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made it a decree, every man that shall hear the 
the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sax butts, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worship that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Well, that's a, that's a choice, isn't it? You've got a choice today. Your choice is to worship this idol. If you don't, there's the furnace. There's the fire. See, they didn't believe in freedom of speech back then. They didn't believe of freedom of liberty for an individual. They believed that you'd need to do exactly what the king said, when he said it, and how he said to do it. If not, there are dire consequences. That's the way they ruled in those times. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Wow. Here's all this vast amount of people. And, you know, there's this pressure when crowds do it, everybody does it, because everybody's doing it. Kind of like what we just kind of went through in this past scenario of the, the shutdown and the demand that you better get it vaccinated. And if you don't get it vaccinated, in fact, some are, are spouting right now that if you don't get the vaccine, they, you should be thrown into prison. Well, they're, they're, what happened to our freedom of choice? What happened to the cry, it's my body, I can do with it what I want? What happened to that cry, huh? Oh, it, it goes away when it comes down to not doing what they want you to do and whoever they are. <clears throat> Similar spirit. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the same spirits are now alive and well in the day that you and I live in. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. We are living in the evil day. So, uh, verse 13 through 15, Nebuchadnezzar interviews the disobedient Hebrew men. Or, excuse me, verses 8 through 12, three Hebrew men refuse the demand. And then in verse 13 through 15, Nebuchadnezzar interviews the disobedient Hebrew men. Notice in verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? I just can't believe it. You know, when you guys came to my country and I put you in uh, prominent positions because of your commitment to your God and the things that you did and, and, and the desire to serve your God and you were just wise and, 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 and remarkable individuals and I put you in charge of this, is it true that when I make a command you're not doing what I say? I cannot believe my ears. That's essentially what Nebuchadnezzar here is saying. He said, Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods? Nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sax butt, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But! If you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? And you just see him in his pompous, boasting attitude. What God is there that could deliver you from this awful event? Kind of mocking their God.
And I can just see those three Hebrew children standing there before this great and powerful king, and, and they don't even winch. They don't even, you know, they're just not even bothered by what he said. They're just like, whatever. You, know, you do what you have to do. We're going to do what we have to do. Because these men were committed. They didn't serve God when it was convenient. They didn't serve God when it was easy going. They didn't serve God when uh, when the government said you could go to church. They they went to church even when the government said you couldn't go to church. Why would the government ever say that? You think they don't like churches? Yeah, they don't like churches. Why? Because we hold the very absolute truth of the word of God in our hands and they don't like the God that we serve. And if they can stop us and they can prevent us from doing what we need to be doing, well, it's one more mark for Satan. But let me tell you, I've already read the last book of the Bible, and I know that God wins. If you're born again by the Spirit of God, you're on the winning side. Oh, I know some days you wake up, you don't feel like you're winning, but it's all right. God has already won the battle. You just got to pick up the rewards. It's coming. And one day we're going to see it in its full luster when Christ rules and reigns over this world. And you and I have a privilege to be a part of his kingdom to rule and reign with him. And all the things that we've endured until that time will seem as nothing compared to the glory that we shall enjoy with him in his kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to give them another chance, another opportunity. Verses uh, 16 through 18, the three Hebrew men insist they will never worship the image. I like these guys. These guys aren't looking at that fiery furnace and going, well, you know, it is a little hot over there. and Boy, I should like to go home to the, after this is all said and done. And man, I just, uh, I didn't really want to burn up today just like any of us would you know see the choices we have well either bow and worship this golden image or go to the fiery furnace which would you choose well let me tell you they chose the right thing they wasn't afraid of what Nebuchadnezzar could do they were not afraid of the fire and the heat of that furnace because well their God is bigger than Nebuchadnezzar their God is able to take them in the fire and out of the fire and no problem. Just like God said, he will always be with us anywhere and everywhere we go in the storms, out of the storms. And Jesus was always with them through the storms. And he will always be with you through the storms. Notice what they said. Verse 16 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But just in case... <laughs> I like how they're uh, thinking here. They think, well, you know, maybe we haven't behaved ourselves. Maybe we won't make it through the fire. But that's okay. I'm a living sacrifice for God, and I will be a dying sacrifice for God if that be what God has for me. See, God knows what's best. Verse 18, but if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. In the fire or out of the fire, it doesn't matter to us. We've already made a commitment. We've already made a determination that whatever comes, the one thing is certain, we're going to stay true in our service and commitment to our God. That we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Well, you can just imagine that didn't make Nebuchadnezzar happy at all. How dare these three Jewish men challenge me? Don't they see 
how powerful of a person I am. Don't they see all the, the wonders that I have built and all the wonders that I have? How dare these men challenge me? How hot is that furnace? Well, let's heat it up seven times more because when they go in, they're going to melt going in. He's upset. He's angry. He's mad. You know, that's generally the rule in this old world that you and I live in. When you challenge them with the truth, you know what most of the time happens is they get angry and upset and call you names because that's about all they have. They don't have anything to talk about factual. They just want to call you names. Make fun of your God. Make fun of your church. Make fun of your Bible. That's about all they got. Well, let me tell you, none of that's going to work in their favor. You know, of all the books that have been written in the world, this is the number one book that is many countries will not allow to come into their country legally. Unbeknownst to them, there have been many people, many men that have been willing to pack their suitcases full of Bibles and deliver them into communist China. Even right now, there's probably those doing that. At the peril of their life and losing their family. Those are some people that are dedicated. There's a lot of countries that will not allow the Word of God to enter. But, in spite of all their efforts and all their challenges, it's still being brought in. Even the very building in... Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the British Isles where an atheist stood one day and said by the end of my life there will not be a Bible left in the world and that very building they print the Bible God is a powerful God you put him to the test and God will always come through for you but you know, well, the problem is many of us don't want to find out. Many of us don't want to be tested and tried. Many of us don't want to go that far with God, even though he was willing to go all the way for us. And we should be willing. These men were willing. They were going to lose everything. They were going to lose their family and their wealth and everything they know. And their lives were going to be snuffed out in an instant in the fiery furnace of judgment. Verses 24 through um, or verses 19 through 23. Let's, uh, let's see here. I need to catch up. Then when Nebuchadnezzar full of fury in form of his vintage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. I'm going to turn up the fire. You guys think that I'm kidding? You think I'm playing games here? You're about to find out. I'm going to, I'm going to turn it up seven times. Now, I don't know what it matters, seven times or one time. Fire is fire. It's going to burn you, right? But he wants to make sure they go in and never come out. I don't know why he thought they might be coming out, but there may be some reason. These men stood against the most powerful individual in the known world at that time. And they wouldn't, you know, as it said, they were not careful how they answered Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, we're not going to serve your God. And, and, and just so you know, if you throw us in the fiery furnace, we didn't serve your God. It's a win-win for us. We're going to stay alive and, and stay here in this providence and, and serve uh, the Babylonians, or we're going to go to heaven. Not a big, big problem for us. Verse 20, and he commanded the most mighty men. Notice, he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Mish Once again, there's a hint here that he's, uh, he's felt a little of this challenge coming from them, and he's beginning to think, maybe they know something I don't know, and maybe the God that they serve, he is the God that I don't know about. 
I, I just get this feeling that turning up the, the furnace seven times, and then he gets his mighty men of the army to come and, and bind these three men up. He's thinking, you know, there's something going on here. And he casts them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now get this. Nebuchadnezzar got his mightiest men to tie these guys up. And to have these guys take them and throw them into the fiery furnace. And as these guys were throwing them in the fiery furnace, they died. These were the mightiest men of his army. They died at the door of the furnace. What does that tell you? It was real hot. That's what it tells you. It was real hot. Nebuchadnezzar sees four alive and well in the furnace. Now, I, I just imagine that when Nebuchadnezzar thought he'd take a look inside, he was expecting to see his, these three Hebrew men dead and gone. That's what he's expecting, right? So... Uh, I'm sure he kind of walks over to the door of the furnace, but he kind of stands back a bit because he's seen what happened to his mighty men. So he's, he's stepping back a bit here, and he's looking in there to see what he can see. Nebuchadnezzar sees four alive and well in the furnace. Very inspected scene here. Verse 24. And then uh, Nebuchadnezzar king was astounded and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king, you got it right. Three, three men. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four. I'm counting one, two, three, and there's a fourth one. Where'd he come from? I didn't throw him in the fire. Where'd he show up? Why is he there? What's he doing? He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loosed, loose and walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the former, the fourth, I don't know where he got this at, but let me tell you, when you see God, you know he's God. I see the fourth like the Son of God. You know, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't on the road to Damascus and met the Lord Jesus Christ. Nebuchadnezzar was not there when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up and spoke to Abraham with his two angels and telling him, I'm going to go over here and destroy these cities because they're so wicked, and I'm checking them out, and if we don't find ten people, they're gone. The same one that walked many times before his birth in Bethlehem among the people. Here he is in the midst of the fiery furnace with his three brave soldiers of the cross. They absolutely were not going to bow to that golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up no matter what it cost them. And folks, as far as they knew, it's going to cost them everything. And that didn't trouble them. Why? Because they were men of faith, believing their God could do the impossible. You know, I think those are the same words that the angel Gabriel told Mary. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, those are the same words that God is speaking to you day in and day out. What are you troubled by? What are you challenged with? What's coming down the road that is about to just disrupt your life? 
Keep in mind you serve a God that can do the impossible. Quite a surprise here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is looking into the fiery furnace. He finds those individuals walking about and they've got company. And the fourth is like the Son of God. The three Hebrew Men leave the furnace unharmed, verses 26 through 27. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, and this has never happened before, but it's happening this day. He called the men out that had gone into the fiery furnace. I'm sure he was thinking, I can't believe this is happening. I cannot believe that this is happening. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth! Come hither! Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the prince, and the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no body. Let me tell you, they didn't even have their eyebrows singed. And I get my eyebrows singed all the time, cooking stuff out on the grill, you know. They didn't even have a hair on their head singed from the fire. They came out just like they went in, untainted, no compromise, completely intact. The fire had no power, because greater is he that they serve than he that put them in the fire. He says uh, there in verse 20, he says, saw these uh, men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were not going to worship the golden idol. And they knew they were going to go to the fire, and they were more than happy to do so for the sake of the Most High. It wasn't a problem with them. Would it have been a problem with you? You know, those of you that have been born again by the Spirit of God and aren't serving God, it will be a problem when you are faced with challenges of this world. You when you have persecution and trials and tribulation, you will be bothered because you're not secure in your salvation. See, salvation it comes one day you are saved, but it's another thing to work out your salvation in fear and trembling daily. Daily you're to serve God. It's not that that keeps you saved or makes you more saved, but it's the least you can do for the most high God to be faithful in your service to him. Notice in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges the greatness of the God of these three Hebrews. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. These three Hebrew men, <clears throat> they were confronted with a overwhelming challenge. But this day, it did not matter what the king has said what the decree that has been sent out and what they were demanded to do, what mattered this day is they were true to their God and because of their sacrifice and because of their witness and testimony, they changed the king's word. So 
So what does he do? Well, he probably does something that really, really is not necessary. He tries to legislate righteousness. You can't legislate righteousness. It's an individual relationship with God that makes a person righteous and makes a person do the right thing. But Nebuchadnezzar, you know, in his wisdom, he decides to make a proclamation that nothing evil should be said against the God of the Hebrews. And I'm sure there were a lot of people thinking, wow, that's pretty incredible. We were just about ready, you know, a lot of us, we, we bowed down and worshiped that golden idol. Now he's telling us, wrong God, wrong, you know, want, wrong thing to do. There's only one true God. And look at these three guys. They serve the most high God. They're not like the rest of you that just, well, everybody else is doing it, so I better do it too. You know, just because they pass laws in Congress doesn't make it right. Because those are wicked men doing wickedness. And, it, and to them, it, well, they are, they're willing to do whatever it takes just so they can appease the crowd and they can keep getting their paycheck. I guarantee, you know, if we made a law that said, you know, if they didn't do their job, they didn't get paid, I bet you some of them guys either get in or get out. I mean, some of them have been there for a long time, and some of them got very wealthy for a long time. And how do you go into Congress and not having a, uh, barely enough food to feed your family, and then all of a sudden you become a multimillionaire? Well, it's called inside trading, which is illegal. And the hammer's about ready to come down on a bunch of them guys that have been collecting these uh, revenues from these investments that they knew aforetime before it was going to happen. They're going to pass the law to make it happen, so they're going to invest, and they made all that money. And many of them sided with the, pharmacy, the pharmaceutical companies to make that money. They make hundred billion dollars in the last three years of all this medicine that has been shipped out. Notice in verse 29 through 30. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. There's one thing that Nebuchadnezzar learned that day. He's not God. There is a true God, and Nebuchadnezzar's not even near him. And so he makes this decree. If I hear of any of you saying anything about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I don't like it, you're dead. Period. No trial. No examination. Whatever I hear, it's going to be, you're going to be executed. I like verse 30. What would you do with those three men that just came out of the furnace? Well, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do a lot, but he did what he could. And he wanted to show his appreciation for these men. Of a, They had some backbone. They had some resilience. They had some commitment. And they wouldn't just fall in the crowd. They just wasn't doing the convenient thing. They stood when it cost them everything. Verse 30 says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. They got promoted. God promoted them. They were willing to stand for God. They weren't going to bow down to some golden image. They weren't going to bow down to some false god. They are going to stand. It was going to cost them everything, and they stood and they got thrown into the worst furnace of fire that you could ever find, and it didn't even affect them. Now I know this world runs on a fear factor. They want you to do something, 
They're going to put the fear in you that, boy, you better listen because they have all the answers. Really? Science has all the answers? I have a question for science, if they have all the answers. Why in the world do we have to strip asbestos from all the buildings and, and places that they put asbestos in if science has all the answers? Science doesn't have all the answers. God has all the answers. The, at best, what science is doing is discovering the mystery of God. But they don't have all the answers, folks. I guarantee if you take a textbook of science in the high school today and, and look at that science book, and you take a science book that came back from the 60s, you'll see a vast difference between the two. Why? Because they changed their science. Because what they thought they knew, they didn't know. But now what they know, they wish they had it known. So don't let that trouble you on the, on the TV set when they claim, I know my science. Really? Well, there's a few of those guys around claiming they know got their science down right, and they've got it completely wrong. All you have to do is do a little study, and you'll find out. Some of these guys are just big, fat liars. And someday they're going to pay, if not in this life, in the life to come. But you don't worry about them. You worry about you. What am I going to do to serve my God in the days going forward? Are you going to be accountable for Jesus Christ? Or are you going to be one of those that quit and go by the wayside? We need some men and women who have the faith to stand no matter what comes down. Who'd have thought what we just went through the last three years would ever happen in America? But it did. Who ever thought we'd have a bunch of men and women in Congress who are livid about murdering babies by the millions? And that's exactly what they're doing today, giving women the right. My question is, why are you even getting pregnant? That's where it should stop. That's where it needs to stop. These uncontrolled sexual wild people that go out and do all kinds of matter things, and then they have to deal with the consequences, and so they're going to murder that child instead of putting it up for an adoption. We have a little young man, well... Penny's grandson is adopted, but uh, we have a little Noah, and uh, he came from a, a family that would have destroyed his life, but Dave and Ashley decided they were going to adopt this little one out of their relative who was having this child, and knowing that it was going to turn out well if it was left with them, and so they took it upon themselves to adopt little Noah. He's a fascinating little young man, and and uh, Dave was sharing with me the other day. You know, I think that's why the Lord sent us to uh, to Idaho for a while because that's brought this whole thing to pass, and now we're back. Um, you know, there's a lot of things differently that people could do, but oh, uh, the the multitudes are crying out. You know, Where's my right to do this, to do that, to do whatever? You know. My question is, why do I have to wear a seatbelt? It's my right. If I want to fly through the windshield when I have a wreck, that should be my right. But I tell you what, they're going to give you a ticket if you don't put your seatbelt on. You know that? I haven't got one in a long time. But it could happen. Try to be an obedient servant of the Lord. And the sooner I get to heaven, the happier I'll be, okay? So just don't. Don't, don't let it bother you. <laughs> and I shouldn't even gone there. I can see that right now. I should have left that one long ago. <laughs> well, what are you going to do when they come after you? And let me tell you, the world's coming after you. Little ways here, little ways there, but eventually they're going to come after you. What are you going to do? Are you going to be a people of faith? Are you going to take a stand? Or are you going to be one of those that give up, quit? 
What's that going to be like when you get to heaven and, uh, and the Lord says to you, well, you know, I was there with you when you were facing that terrible, awful tribulation and instead of taking a stand, you gave up on me. I didn't give up on you. See, all these rewards I could have given you, but I can't give them to you because that day you chose to do the thing that was convenient than taking a stand. And so many people are going to be in heaven. They're going to be there, as the Bible says, it's going to be a fire escape. Oh, they didn't go to hell. They're not going to burn forever. They're in heaven, but that's all. They just made it to heaven. Barely made it to heaven. If it wasn't God saving them, they wouldn't even have been there, of course, as none of us would be. They're saved. They didn't do anything with their salvation. They never took the time to read their Bible. They never took the time to share the gospel with someone. They never took the time to be a part of a fellowship of believers. Because life, and I've heard this a number of times, I'm too busy for church. You know, if you're that busy, you're really too busy. I mean, I'm a pretty busy guy. My wife's a pretty busy woman. But you know, we always find time for church. You know, it's what's important to you. Look at Mary Bell. How many of you would drive 60 mile round trip to go to church? My goodness. I wish I had 100 people dedicated like Mary Bell. You, I know what she's going to hear when she enters into heaven. Thy good and faithful servant. She's dedicated. She comes to play piano. I'm so thankful we have the best piano player in the world. Amen? Amen. That's right. <laughs> it does matter what you do, and it does matter how you live. You will either be blessed or you'll be cursed. You make the decision. Now let's all stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. We enter this new week. What will you do in this new week? Will you make a difference for Jesus Christ? Or will you just add to the troubles of this world? Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to once again open up the living word of God and have it speak to us. And, and Father, these great men that took the stand to do the right thing. All the, all the things that must have entered their minds as they were confronted with such an awful decision, but they thought nothing to die for you. They thought nothing to have their bodies burned for taking a stand. Father, forgive us when we are not willing to take a stand, when we're not facing severe persecution or tribulation like these men just some little things that we let bother us when it comes time to be a witness and a testimony help us father to overcome that allow the spirit of god to motivate and move us in ways that we can say it has been truly a wonderful journey from here to heaven because we've served the most high god father help us to be committed and doing those things. In Jesus' holy and sweet name we pray. Amen.